Stop me if you've been here before. You get to the tee pad and you're playing with a bunch of other disc golfers who've either been playing longer than you have or they're better than you are. And all of a sudden you start questioning every single shot you're doing. Should you be throwing a driver here? Should you be throwing a mid range? What should I be putting with? All those different thoughts can creep into your mind when playing with other disc golfers. In this episode, we sit down with Chandler Fry, who explains why you should be a well-rounded disc golfer and why you shouldn't just focus on your strengths. You should also focus on your weaknesses and work to improve those weaknesses and how you should not always copy those other players on your card and you should stick to your game plan. Chandler Fry is sponsored by Discraft and one of the best disc golfers out on tour. And in this episode, we get to learn a little bit more about him, about his journey, how he has climbed to the top of the sport and how Discraft ended up signing him and why Discraft has become so powerful when it comes to signing players. In this episode, you're also going to learn why clout is such an important thing on the disc golf course and why most pro players need to have that clout and need to do cool things on coverage in order to continue to build their brand and grow their exposure. You're going to want to make sure you stay tuned through the episode because you'll get to hear about Chandler's incredible dog story and how it completely changed his disc golf season, as well as you're going to hear who he thinks is going to win the 2020. 22 Disc Golf World Championship. Thank you guys so much for all the support you have given us. Thank you for the ratings on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Thank you for hitting that subscribe button over on YouTube. We've got weekly videos coming out every Wednesday, 1215 Central Standard Time nowadays. So make sure you go over there and check out the newest video we're going to be having dropping. If you are watching on YouTube and you like this hat that I got on, hey, hit us in the DMs. We got some new merch available and I can send you what we got over and maybe we can hook you guys up. With all that said, let's go ahead and let's get Chandler Fry in here right now. Hello, this is Chandler Fry, and you are listening to the Chain Clankers Podcast. Alrighty, everyone, let's welcome on one of Discraft's top athletes right now, Chandler Fry. How are we doing tonight, man? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Doing pretty good. You know, we're not out there, you know, a little jealous, you know, every time we interview someone when they're on tour, it seems, you know, very exciting when we're living that life. Um, year on tour full time this year. Has that been kind of, how, have you been on tour for a while? This is my second year full time touring. Um, I've tried in the past. Uh, my first try was 2020, but COVID kind of derailed that entire experience. Uh, 2020, 2021, uh, 2021 was my first year and this is my second full year, but uh, it's, it's a, uh, it's fun. Like the, just on paper, the idea of touring is, uh, it looks like just a huge adventure, just new places every weekend. And it is amazing. Like I get to play new courses, see new, uh, see new things every week, meet new people, but it's also, it's also a grind. There's a lot of driving time that goes into it. A lot of uh, logistics that you have to take care of, but overall it's a fantastic lifestyle. That's awesome, man. I know me personally, the other week I went to, because we're in Wichita, Kansas, and, and the, the fiance and I, we went to Colorado Springs for the weekend, and I think it was like seven hours in the car, and I was ready to rip my hair out. So shout out to you guys for being able to put the miles in. I personally could not do that. So I, I kind of want to start then, you know, what what made you go from, you know, maybe being a weekend warrior to, you know what, I am going to tour, I'm going to get out there full time. What was that decision for you? Yeah, disc golf's kind of been the constant thing in my life. Like, I've, always, I've had different jobs, I've been in different places, but disc golf has always been that one thing. And with the recent growth of disc golf, I, I I know I'm talented, so I was just like, I gotta try it out, see if it works out. And I I, put, I grinded last year in 2021. I played 31, 32 tournaments, played fairly decent. And uh, after Discraft reached out to me and said, hey, we're putting you on the elite team, I knew that um, this was a true career choice for me if I chose to accept that opportunity. So um, I, I put, I'm putting everything that I have into it right now. Um, my entire life is disc golf. I'm not really doing anything as far as uh, like even relationships. You know, I'm just like focused. So uh, uh, this is what I'm doing, and I decided to do it, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know that – explosion you know with these last couple of years that money you know that fan base that audience and everything i feel like it's 
the perfect time for, you know, to do that, to jump into it. I feel like it's a little bit less scary for sure to be like, all right, I'm going to drop everything and I'm going to do this full time. Yeah. Have, you know, that's great. Ha, what has that done to the competition? You know, like this year compared to like a few years ago, what did, what does that look like out there on tour? Yeah, the competition in the last couple of years has been absolutely fierce. Like, we have a lot of the old heads, um, a lot of the players, especially myself, 30-plus-year-olds, Paul Ulibar, Nate Sexton, uh, Big Germ, who are still absolute shredders. Even, like, Paul, you know, they're all insanely talented. Um, but now we're seeing these younger kids coming in. I, I'm playing with kids who I started playing disc golf before they were born. It's absolutely insane. Like, uh, Gannon Burke, Cole Verdalen, Ty Love, some insane talent. Um, it's great to see. Um, it means the future of the sport is bright. But at the same time, as a competitor, I'm just like, stop, you know, <laughs> give me a um, But competing with these kids and seeing that they love the sport just as much as I did when I was their age um, is, is just inspiring to me, at, 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 but also um, somewhat disheartening, <laughs> if I'm being honest. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, it's hard to not feel that way. You know what I'm saying? Like, if yeah. I was in your shoes, I'd be like, man, I wish I was 16 right now and disc golf starting to get big and you can start making yeah. some money because, you know, no offense or anything, but like they're going to have a longer opportunity to be big heads in the sport, you know, by the time that they're even Horatio's age or something like that, they're going to be able to have acquired so much skills, so much money, but it's, I wish that I was good at 12 years old. So that way at 16 years old, you know, whatever, so on and so forth. But I, I want to start then, you know, cause you kind of talked about these younger guys. I want to talk about your younger self next, you know, what was disc golf for you when you first got into it? How did you find the sport of disc golf? Yeah, so my family's always been pretty competitive. I have a brother and a dad who um, we love playing games. Um, not so much anymore. We're kind of doing our own thing nowadays. But whenever we get on the course, we love playing together. But we, So the way it started was my dad and I, I think we were just hanging out in the front yard. Like he might have been tending to his uh, palm trees or something like that. Uh, in Washington, he loves palm trees. Uh, but uh, we saw some guys throwing ultimate frisbees at like trash cans and uh, light poles. And we we're just like, what are you doing? And they said, we're playing object golf. And so we looked it up and we discovered disc golf. And we thought what we, what, what, we found what we thought was the nearest disc golf course to us, which was like two and a half hours south in Oregon, which I'm, you guys might be familiar with uh, Milo MacGyver State Park in Estacada, Oregon. It's the site of Beaver State Fling every year. And so we went, we got some ultimate frisbees. We didn't necessarily know what discs were yet, but we got some ultimate frisbees, went down and played the entire Milo MacGyver course. Um, I must have shot probably like 150 or something, but we, I remember having a blast. I remember we threw in a couple shots from like 50 feet and we're just like, no, my God, this is amazing. And uh, so we finished the first round and then some actual disc golfers was like, we're like, hey, just so you guys know, there's actual discs. And so we went to a local pro shop, which is no longer there anymore, unfortunately. But I got a, I believe what was a Discraft Magnet and a Discraft Elite Z Wildcat, I think is the, the plastic in the disc. And we went, we went back out, played a second round, and I remember we couldn't throw the discs. or We couldn't do it. But uh, we definitely, the bug was, uh, the seed was planted, and uh, we were just hooked from there on out. So... What did that look like? You know, did you guys look for more courses? Did you play locally? Because you said, you know, about two hours away. That kind of sucks, you know, if you really want to play yeah. the sport. Did you later find out that there was some other ones closer, or was that the one that was the closest? Yeah, there were some courses that were a lot closer. We lived like 30 minutes away from uh, Steelicum Disc Golf Course, which was the, one of the oldest courses in the country, actually, like built in the 1970s. But uh, my dad and my mom, um, they actually ran a puzzle business, which is kind of odd, but cool. And so they traveled up and down the I-5 corridor on the West, Co West Coast doing craft shows and uh, festivals. And so on those trips, my dad and I and my brother, um, and at times my mom would join us, uh, we'd uh, stop at, we'd have like the book, the PG PDGA directory, and we'd uh, get the directions from the book and head on to the nearest course and play those like every trip and we used to keep track of all the courses we played, but at, at some point there was just too much. We ran out of room, and uh, we just we just played for the fun of it. So, yeah, that's awesome. How long did you just kind of like play for the fun of it? Like, when did you kind of start taking it more seriously? 
Yeah, so I started playing like late 2002, and in 2003, my dad and I, my dad was like, "Let's play a tournament, might as well." And so we signed up for a novice tournament at um, Timber Park, which is actually like 20 minutes from Milo MacGyver in the same town. And uh, I actually ended up winning that one by one stroke over a, a buddy of mine, James Moore, who uh, is still a great talent. doesn't doesn't travel. He has a job and all that, a real world job, you know. Um, but yeah, so we, we, that kind of got us hooked into tournaments. Um, and then we started playing more and more. And I think I played intermediate for a year, advanced for two years and went pro in 2000, like late 2007, early 2008. And, uh, yeah, I've been playing pro since then. So about 14 years now. Was there something from the very beginning that you were kind of naturally good at, you know, distance or putting or uh, approach or anything like that? I, I honestly, I can't remember if I was good at any one thing when I first started, but like in the first couple of years, the first maybe three years, I identified putting as kind of my, uh, my, my signature. I remember focusing on that, putting a lot of hours in my backyard putting and making sure that when I did go to tournaments, like I can be a sprinkler system off the tee pad, but if I made that 50 footer, that's all that really matters. So, and that's, that's definitely carried on to who I am now. I think if people think of me, and they ask themselves what I do best on the course. It's uh, it's on the green. I'm uh, I'm definitely working towards getting better off the tee pad, and I think it's so- showing somewhat in the stats this year. Um, but yeah, putting is my thing. <laughs> nice. So I I have this question that I've kind of been holding on to for a really long time since Horatio and I had done an episode on this. It, it was kind of like a hot take debate ish kind of question. Pretty much the way the question went was, would you rather make every single putt within circle one, or would you rather be able to throw 400 feet, you know, every single time you threw like 400 was literally zero effort at all. So I wanted to ask a a touring pro like yourself, someone who is really good at putting, who has good distance for maybe, maybe for you and then maybe just, you know, for the average course or whatever, what do you think would be more valuable being able to throw 400 feet with zero effort or making every single putt within circle one? I'm immediately going towards the putt because putting wins championships. There's a, in almost every single world championship playoff, every single elite se- series um, playoff, it comes down to a putt, whether it be like even a 15 foot putt or even like a 35, 40 foot putt. Like if I can take it, take the opportunity to make every single putt within 33 feet, I would definitely take that. Cause I would take away the nerves and I just, I just start winning everything, you know? Um, but being able to throw, with, with ease would be kind of nice as well. Cause sometimes you're just like, especially at a course we're playing at this week in the thorn in uh, Tyler, Texas, it'd be nice just to be able to have that easy distance, but I'm going with putting all day putting wins championships. Yeah. You know, the more, the more we play and the more we, we get out there, it's definitely, that's more of the stressful portion. But, you know, I feel like my argument of, for that question was that to be competitive, you have to be able to throw 400 at least um, you know, without, without much, much effort to be, you know, especially on tour to be competitive, you to get those birdies, at least, um, you have to be able to have that distance. I agree. And it's, and like the courses we've been playing in the last few weeks, at least the opening part of the 2022 tour, like 450 feet is like a necessary distance these days. Because most of my competitors are 500 plus easy. And I'm like 500 plus on a good day. So I think that's why the putting, uh, yeah, that's why I, I'm a put- putter guy. So, if you're somebody who, like yourself, you know, you say that putting is very crucial and you have to have that good putt uh, in order to be competitive and to potentially win, is that one of those things where you should almost hyper focus in on your putting, understanding that that's what's going to give you an opportunity to win the most, or should you try to spend more of your time trying to gain that distance or accuracy? What, what do you think someone should work on more? Yeah, I think it should be a pretty um, balanced effort in your practice. You should be you should be doing all the all the tricks and should be getting all the tools in your bag. Um, I think putting put, practice putting is probably the easiest form of practice. You don't have to go to a field. You don't have to really um, go anywhere. You can just go to your backyard and putt. So I think it's just easier to put more work into it. And uh, if you're at home after like playing around or doing some field practice, just go out for thirty minutes to an hour. Or maybe say, like, I'm going to make 100 putts every day or something like that. It's just a lot easier to put the work in there. But to answer your question totally, um, it should be a balanced 
um, practice routine. You should be able to work on everything. Do you practice, do you find yourself practicing, you know, of course you have the course that you go and practice to, uh, but I guess in your free time, you know, you don't want to be at the course the whole time. Do you do a lot more putting practice when you're on tour or do you try to squeeze some field work in? Field work is definitely taking the back burner, um, at least for my practice routine during tour. In the off season, it's weekly. Um, But when I'm on the tour, I usually just try to focus on the courses I'm playing and then do putting practice either after or before the round, depending on when I'm playing. Um, I try to schedule my practice around my first or my tee times for the um, either the first day, second day, or third day. And then, uh, yeah, kind of model it around, like get there an hour before the practice round, do some putting, and then play the practice round, and then maybe do some putting. Or if I identify something that's not working during the round, I might do some field work. Like if, I, if I'm not getting my buzzes um, – straight you know get out there and see if it's the buzzes that are that are having the issue or maybe it's a form flaw or yeah just if i identify something just work on that but usually it's just a course practice and practice putting for me when you're on tour how much of your time is actually spent on disc golf and how do you keep yourself from burning out when playing for that long and that often yeah, burnout is an absolutely real thing on tour. I know, I know even right now, like this is one of the hardest stretches of the tour, the first uh, the first month and a half. And I know a lot of players um, are feeling burnt out already. Um, so you got to definitely, when you're off the course, when you're, you have to just like forget about disc golf for a bit. A lot of players, they do escape rooms. They go out. A lot of people are foodies. They like going out, identifying some cool spots in town, getting, getting in some good grub. Um, personally, I like aquariums and zoos. I, I tend to go to those as much as possible, or if there's a cool national park nearby, you'll find it there. Um, so when I'm playing disc golf, when I'm practicing for disc golf, I'm 100% disc golf. But when I'm not, I'm definitely um, trying to just kind of do stuff for my soul, you know? Because, yeah, just like anything, if you focus too much on it, you're probably going to start hating it a little bit, a little bit <laughs> you know? So you got to balance in some uh, other human activities to make yourself a little more sane because you will burn out if you don't. I found interesting. You said that a lot of players, you know, the first stretch of tour is the toughest and they get burnt out. Is that just because, you know, everyone's coming off off season, feeling hyped, feeling, you know, I'm ready to get it. This is my year. Mm -hmm. And they go out there and maybe, you know, they don't do as well as they expected, or, you know, it's a lot tougher than they remembered. And so they kind of get that check back into tour reality or, you know, why, why do you say that this is like the first stretch is the toughest? Yeah, I think it's a mix. I think it's a combination of coming off the off season, um, not having to drive like 10 plus hours every week to get to the new event. Um, and also, honestly, part of it is the courses we're playing. They're all open. They're all windy. They're all very difficult. Um, and a lot of players, they that doesn't really fit entirely into their game. There's like some that like I prefer wooded courses. I prefer technical, tight um tight courses like I have in Washington. I don't mind the distance. I don't mind um, the wind. But um, after a while, <laughs> like if you guys saw the first round at Waco, like an average person would play that round and be like, I'm not playing disc golf for the next two weeks. That was the worst experience of my life. So um, I think it's a combination of coming off the off season and the courses we're playing and uh, it's just it's just getting hotter and we're just getting acclimated to the whole thing again. But also that being said, disc golfers are some of the hardiest people I know. So even if they are feeling burnt out, they're still going to power through and make it through the season. So, How are you able to switch up your game so fast going from playing in the woods to playing in the open fields and the wind? Like, is there, is there different discs you're putting into your bag? What, what things are you doing differently when you hit a course that's more wooded than one that's more open, I guess? Yeah, disc selection is a huge part of it. Like in Washington, I'm throwing a lot of comets, a lot of fairways, a lot of fairway drivers. Um, and I don't think I've thrown, I maybe thrown a comet once this entire year in tournament. It's pretty insane. And that's one of my favorite discs to throw. But uh, I'm definitely disking up, doing like nukes, forces. I'm just getting those distance drivers working. working. And then like the month leading up to leaving for tour, I was playing Delphi Disc Golf Course in Olympia, Washington, which is a golf course. For, pretty open. There's only like three or four wooded holes. Um, so I was kind of trying to dial in my distance game. And working on like the 450 to 500 foot distance accuracy. But yeah, it's all about uh, disc selection really. Because I want to throw Comets. I love Comets. Uh, after MJ and Brian Earhart showed me the Comet, I haven't stopped throwing it. 
And uh, the more I can throw it, the happier I am. <laughs> but the first month of tour doesn't allow me to really do that. I want to, but I'd probably just end up throwing a thrower in the, the wind and going out of bounds. So, What makes the Comet so good, and how do you throw it that makes it you know, one of your favorite discs? Um, it just has a really cool flip point. You can hit it really hard and know exactly when it's going to turn. And uh, as a player, I, I haven't had a sidearm for uh, a majority of my career. So I've kind of relied on um, the backhand flip to get those sidearm angles. Now that I have a sidearm, I'm using a little less. I still enjoy the Comet, but it was, uh, in, in essence, it was like a sidearm replacement. So when uh, people like Nate Saxton or um, Zach Johnson or Eagle were throwing like touch forehand shots around the corner to the right, you'd see me pulling out the, the big Z Comet. <laughs> But yeah, it's also just a fun disc to throw. It feels, uh, if you if you played Ultimate before disc golf, which I did, it kind of feels similar to a lid where you can, like, you know what, exactly what it's going to do every time you throw it. It has a similar flip and a uh, fun disc. I got to know then, because I'm pretty sure, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I'm pretty sure Paul Macbeth hates the comment. Like, will not bag it, does not throw it. I could be wrong, but I feel like I've heard in the past, he just does not like the comment. Do, do you have any insight as to why that is? I do know that Paul is very particular about his discs. Like you can give him a disc, and he can tell Flippy if it's if it's stable, overstable, if it feels good. Like just the second he touches it, he knows if he if he'll throw it. Um, as for the comet, I'm not entirely sure why he likes it. It's a pretty unique disc. It doesn't feel like most other discs or mid ranges that he um, throws. So I can see it. I can I, I can just see it being different. So he's not he's just not used to. It. He doesn't like it. And uh, honestly, he might might have too much power for it too. Like he has actually, actually that's a lie. He has touch, so I think it's just different. He doesn't need it, doesn't want it, doesn't want anything to do with it. <laughs> I don't want to make this into a Paul Paul episode. We have, you know, but what have you noticed about his game this year? It just seems like he is in, you know, this crazy championship mode, and like he's got that touch and that finesse this year. You know. Have you seen him out there play? Is he like in a different zone that you've seen before, or what's what's he looking like? Yeah, I think last year, Paul, um, he was getting, I think the last couple of years, he was getting the foundation started. He was doing a lot of things for the sport of disc golf, and that uh, he was focusing a little less on himself and his game. Um, he, was, he still played exceptionally well because he's Paul Macbeth. But this year, I think he's got everything um, set. He's it's everything's rolling. He's feeling good, and now he can get back to focusing on winning, which is what he does best. And I played a couple of rounds with him in tournament. I played a couple of practice rounds with him, and uh, it's insane to watch him play because we've been playing the entire um, the entire couple uh, the entire month start of the tour, and it doesn't seem to affect him. Like his discs are going straight through the wind. Mine are like flying up and down, going right and left. The dude's just. Uh, He's on point right now, and I mean, we all know who he is. We all know what he can do, and I'm not surprised at all. I think he's just more focused on his game than he was in the last couple of years, and uh, it's already showing. He's he went first, second already, so he'll probably get he'll probably bag a few more wins this year. He's just a once in a generation talent. Does does your approach change if you're on the same card with him? You know, because I know like myself, if I'm, let's say I'm playing an intermediate and I'm playing against some advanced guys or maybe some pro guys or, you know, whatever it is, maybe someone who's just significantly better than me, should my approach change to what I'm doing or should I just stay the same? Should I be trying to copy what they're doing? Like, how do you look at somebody who could be playing better than you and should you try to emulate what they're doing? You know, how, how can you use them to make you better, I guess, is what I'm I'm getting at yeah i think the answer to that is don't change a thing do what you gotta do but uh i will admit uh i don't know if anyone watched the memorial footage my second round i played with him and he messed me up a couple times because i didn't know this till later but he let he left his discs ho at home he didn't bring his discs he was throwing new discs and so he was throwing like a captain's raptor on everything and it actually made me question what I was doing with my discs. And it made me make a few mistakes because I, I didn't stick to my game plan. The effect he has on players, because even uh, people at my level or even like maybe not Ricky level, but Emerson Keith level, like the guys at the 1040 plus, they they look at Paul and they know they know he knows what he's doing. You know, like he's a five time world champ. He's proven himself. He is really and so even if he makes a disc selection, it might like get in your head and be like, wait. 
am I do, am I doing the wrong thing here? Um, but the answer is you got to stick to your game, and I know that now <laughs> after Memorial, uh, not to not to switch up what I'm doing just based on what he's doing. But uh, he's just a game changer, you know. He's a uh, and honestly, we keep talking about Paul, but you can't talk about disc golf without talking about Paul. You know, just the same as Ken Climo. Like the dudes are the goats. And uh, they they pushed disc golf more than anyone else. You know, they made disc golf what it is. And uh, Paul still has a long career ahead of him. And just being able to play with him a couple times this year already, I, I feel pretty honored, honored. Yeah, you know, so just, you know, being being a part of that, you know, being on the disc craft team, being part of that family, that group, what's that energy like? You know, being part of that, that whole crew, you is there some kind of, uh, you know, motivation, inspiration? Because, you know, in my eyes, at least, you know, still I feel like Discraft is up there, you know, one of the top top brands, one of the top companies, some of the best players, you know, every weekend you're going to have someone finish who's on the Discraft team. So, you yeah. know, they're kind of the ones, you know, at the top. Is there a different energy, you know, that you're carrying into tournaments, you're feeling, you know, especially, you know, having that name on your back? What's that like? Yeah, abs- that's, that's a great question. Absolutely. Like, the confidence that I have this year going into every single round with Discraft on my back is just, it's, I've never felt it before. Just being a part of something like that. Um, Bob Julio at Discraft Disc Golf has created one of the best teams Disc Golf has ever seen. And uh, like being tapped as one of the guys on the, on the elite team, like I can't help but just be like, wow, well, I made it. I'm here I am. I'm, I still have a lot to prove, but having the support of Disc Golf, uh, of Discraft, um, is just amazing. You know, and knowing that I'm right up there representing the uh, the brand with Paul McBeth, Paul Ulibarri, Presnell, Corey Ellis, all those guys is just uh, unbelievable, and it, it definitely it definitely correlates into better play on the course. And also, I mean, I their discs, like the consistency is amazing. I can grab any one of their discs out of the box and know what it's going to do. You know, I'm not I'm not just saying that because I'm sponsored. You know, it's it's unbelievable compared to all the other sponsors I have. Discraft is is way up there is like is the best so yeah I, i'm really glad that you said that last portion because Horatio and i we've had many conversations about how some other manufacturers sometimes you'll pick up a disc and it'll fly one way the first time you get it uh okay you threw it in the river now you got to go get a replacement it's going to maybe fly just a little bit different than it did yeah. the first time so that is definitely something i have noticed as well from discraft is they're just very consistent and you know they are super dominant kind of like you said that they have probably the best pro team around and if you want to compare it to f1 like we've done so many times on our show you know they are the mercedes team out there they are they everyone is stacked everyone is really good so i want to talk a little bit more about how you got onto the elite team you know what were you doing that got you to be with the best of the best was it literally just a simple phone call where they said hey we want you or were you having to put your name out there yeah, so I first started on Discraft in 2019 after being on Latitude for I think five, just like five, a little under five years. Um, and Ulibarri called me up. I was actually t- in talks with DD, um, it, uh, with Eric McCabe about getting on their team. And Ulibarri called me up. He's like, "What do I gotta do to have you put Discraft on your back?" And I was just like, "Honestly, at this point, I don't know what I'm doing with my life or my career, so not a lot." And so he was like, "Hey, what if you play for pay for eight tiers and above and give you some fun?" And I was like, that sounds fantastic. Let's go. And at that point, I was kind of thinking about um, disc golf was just kind of starting to get get going. You know, uh, it wasn't really it definitely wasn't where, it, where it's at now. But there, you can definitely there was definitely some hints of uh, progress. Happening. And so I was still thinking I'll probably just have a nine to five job and be a regional warrior, you know, a regional player. And uh, but. Just like having the discs, they made me a better player. I realized I, I do have the talent to compete still with with these players that are out there right now. And uh, I went on tour in 2021. And as I said before, I grinded. I put 31 tournaments in there. And Discraft, more, more than any other sponsor that I've ever had, recognizes the grind. You know, they see what you're doing. That their communication is fantastic. I talked. I talked to my team manager every a couple times a month. You know. And uh, I, he knew exactly what I wanted from this. He knew exactly what my goals were. He knew exactly where I wanted to be in a couple of years. And uh, him knowing that and him seeing the work that I was putting in, I think he realized that I was a good uh, candidate to be on the elite team. He wanted uh, he wanted hardworking, kind of not necessarily white collar, but just uh, 
American guys, you know, the, to represent the brand and represent a great company. And uh, that's why he tapped me. And I, Ben Calloway as well is uh, similar. The guy put in work last year, was on Jomez multiple times, and uh, he grinded. So, yeah, Discraft recognizes grind, and uh, they they uh, they wanted me to wanted me to be on the team. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think there's definitely something to say about that. You know, I feel like having a social media presence and doing all that is one thing, but being out there at tournaments, you know, and even if, you know, you're not getting a great result every single weekend, but just being out there, you know, the company definitely mm-hmm. sees that, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, you're a a walking marketing ad for the company. And so if you're out there, you know, you're in those tournaments in and out every weekend, like fans are seeing you, people are seeing you. And that's, yeah. at, you know, that's what the company wants. And if you have talent, which I'm sure they see that, they know that, you yeah. know, it's just going to take some time, you know, you, and that that experience, that veteran mentality is going to come up and you're going to make some of those, you know, final round tournaments. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they recognize grind and they also recognize tenacity. You know, they, they saw that, like I've talked to my I mentioned him before, Bob Julio, the team manager, one of the greatest guys I know. Um, we've talked many times. I've, I've gone through multiple injuries. I've gone through multiple uh, setbacks. Like I got bit by a dog a couple years ago. I had to take a month off. Um, but I always come back, you know, and he, I think, uh, as a person him himself, he's, he's gone through a lot as well. So, uh, he recognizes that tenacity, that, uh, that willingness to keep going and not give up. And, uh, yeah, and that he, he brings that culture into this craft, but also, yeah, social media presence is, uh, is huge as well. Awesome. So let, let's talk a little bit maybe about those setbacks. Could you maybe go into a little bit more detail about what they were and what you were doing after they happened to kind of get back to where you were and continue to improve? Yeah, I'll, I'll focus primarily on uh, the dog bite, which was a, ter- a terrible experience in my life. It was actually at Texas States uh, in 20, 2019. I was at the awards ceremony and I was playing with Hogan, Luke Humphrey's dog. I was playing tug of war. And I, the, Hogan was growling, you know, doing what dogs do because we were playing tug of war at Roughhausen. And this other dog behind me, I'm not sure if he thought I was hurting Hogan or something, but he came up and just latched onto my leg. And uh, uh, luckily enough, he let go and uh, ran away. But uh, it left a puncture wound in my right leg that was uh, like two, like a two in, a one and a half, two inches deep. And I had to go to the ER. I had to get it, a hematoma rose uh, rose off my leg. That was like an inch high. It was disgusting. I had to get seven shots because the guy didn't know if he ha- he didn't have his rabies vaccination. He was like, he's he's good, he's good. And I was like, I need to see the paper. Um, but yeah, I couldn't walk for a couple of days. And then uh, by the t- by the time I was able to walk, I was limping and I couldn't play disc golf, couldn't compete. And so what I chose to do was stay on the tour, and uh, caddy, <laughs> caddy for friends, and just kind of still be there. But uh, it, it hurt because I wanted to play. I wanted to be there and, and compete, but uh, I just wasn't I wasn't able to. And uh, I, I had health insurance, so I, that wasn't a problem. And so I got all that taken care of, and I was on uh, anti- antibiotics and all that. But uh, it's stuff. Like, I was out for like three weeks, but uh, it wasn't as bad as possibly something else, like a broken leg or something. Obviously, but um, three weeks for at that point in my life, that's that's a lot of money that I'm losing. That's a lot of potential for like clout that I'm losing. And so uh, that was just one of the setbacks. I also in 2020, I had, or 2021, I believe I had a golfer's elbow. And so I was out for like a month. But uh, yeah, it, it happens. You just gotta, you just gotta keep grinding, keep battling. And I, I every time I've pretty much chosen to stay on the road and uh, just support my friends and still try to represent the brand as best as I can. No one is safe from, you know, any kind of setback, you know, just injuries, elbow injuries or whatnot, or, you know, a dog bite, that's insane. But, you know, Ricky Wysocki, he had his thing, you know, uh, with Lyme's disease and then came back, you know, stronger than ever, I feel like. So, yep. you know, what, did you come back hungry from that? You know, did you come back like, man, I, I miss this. I want, like, I, this is what, you know, did you just come like mad and, you know, I want to compete? <laughs> I came back pretty much the same, just maybe a little less, honestly, if I'm being if I'm being honest with you. Um, yeah, I didn't really compete that well for the rest of the year after that dog bite, honestly. It was a big setback. 
I think I had some momentum going into that, uh, going into the next weekend, and dog bite just kind of derailed me. But uh, it takes a special person for like to and come back from it even stronger, you know. And I played with Ricky last weekend, and that guy makes everything, everyone play better, <laughs> you know. Like he's an absolute monster out there, and knowing that he he battled uh, not only Lyme disease but a couple other injuries in his, in his career, and now he's just where he is now having never lost to Texas States ever that he's competed at. Pretty good. <laughs> he's pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. I literally was telling Horatio before we uh, got like got going with this interview, I was like, yeah, literally Ricky has never lost at this Texas States, uh, at least as long as he's been on the Pro Tour. So uh, unfortunately, yeah. this episode will come it's out on- after uh, Texas States, so we could all be looking silly. But yeah, that's incredible. Yeah, he's a monster. Um, his putting, he like I, I got to see. I was able to witness his spin putt last weekend in the in the Texas wind, and uh, he's he's a, he's he's crazy. He's he's right up there with Paul with being a once in a generation, or I guess twice in a generation talent for Ricky and Paul. These guys are just the work they put into disc golf shows. Yeah. For Yeah, I think um, barring like condi- like crazy conditions, uh, if I'm just 100% circle one, 33% circle two, those are my goals every tournament. And if I can stay in bounds, I think I had three out of bounds last week, and if I can just stay in bounds this week, and I think that means what I'm hoping for is a top 10 finish. Um, this course doesn't really fit my style too well. I can throw decently far, but um, compared with some of these other young guns, it's going to be difficult. Any weekend is a chance to win. Um, but the consistency for me, I haven't been seeing it yet. I've been putting in the work and I know it will come, but, uh, if I'm just consistently inbounds making my putts, I'm going to have a good weekend. I just got to avoid those big numbers that I've been seeing these last couple of tournaments. It's been brutal. Just like a double bogey every round. It's just been awful. <laughs> and that just kills you because like you're losing three strokes immediately. Like you're, you're essentially playing against perfection every weekend. Because there's going to be at least one player shooting a 1080 plus. You know, maybe like five years ago, 1080 was like the hot round for the entire weekend, for the, like the, for all tournaments in that weekend. And nowadays, it's, they're popping off three, four every, every round. It's, it's pretty crazy to, to watch. Um, and uh, I just hope to be one of those guys. <laughs> Yeah, I feel it coming. And Horatio, you're right. I'm glad you brought it up. The clanker's bump is legitimate. Like I know, I think the I think the last one that we had was we interviewed Brian Schweberger, and then he went on to win back to back tournaments the next weekend. So I'm I'm just saying, it, it, if you get the W, well, I'm gonna claim the clanker's bump happened again, at least from our side. Um, but I, no, no offense to clankers, but. When you talk about Schwebe, he wins a tournament every weekend. So uh, yes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yes, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I'm just when, – when I see a trend going, I'm going to put it in the box just to, uh, you know, keep keep that ball rolling. But, and, and no. you know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting because earlier you had talked about, uh, about like, clout and stuff like that, right? You, you needed mm-hmm. to have, you know, miss, having the dog bite, missing out on that clout. You know, what is the importance of playing well at tournaments? What is the importance of getting on Jomez, getting on Gatekeeper, yeah. getting on those other cards? Like, is that legitimately, like – what gets you the next bag of money or the next deal or the next fundraiser opportunity? Like, is that truly important out there? It is important. It's not the one thing that gets you all that, but it definitely helps. Like uh, this last weekend, I got 10th place, which is fine at Belton open, open at Belton. 
10th place is fantastic. But the thing that really stood out to a lot of people was, I don't know if you saw it, but that skip shot that I made on hole 14 in the last round. Um, that's the thing that people are going to remember. That's the thing that's going to build my brand. That's the thing that's going to help out Discraft the most. Like, no one's going to be like, oh, yeah, Chandler got 10th place at Belton. My dad might say that, and he, he might be super proud. But uh, the majority of players that aren't that, that know me are going to be like, oh, that skip shot was sick. And then also a lot of players that don't know me are now going to remember me for that shot. So I think uh, not being like and, and the chance to be on Jomez and to hit that shot or for my for my situation, gatekeeper and to hit that shot um, just to be on, on coverage. That's that's huge because you could throw that shot on the fifth card and not be covered and no one would see it. And then you'd be like, oh, you type it up on Facebook. Be like, I hit a sick shot today and no one would really care. But the fact that it's on there, you can you can replay it and slow it, slow mo it, and everything. That's that's the big thing in this day and age with uh, TikTok and Instagram and all that. You can just put that on there, get the views, and get the get the clout. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's why you know one of the reasons why Simon Lazat has had such a huge career. You know, he I feel like in his early age he was definitely a competitor and finished and won tournaments, but then he became more of a really good at entertaining and you know just doing really cool stuff you know kind of like what you're talking about and made a huge name for himself and he's still like you know an amazing disc golfer but people tune in to watch him because he could just do something crazy like you're talking about you know any round absolutely uh he is one of the greatest throwers of the disc to ever exist um and he, he does things every weekend that even if he's not on coverage that still amaze me but uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, his uh, YouTube channel is one of the greatest YouTube, disc golf YouTube channels out there. Like, there's a reason why he has a hundred plus thousand subscribers. It's because he's a true entertainer, and he's one of those rare guys that he can do that while competing at a high level. Um, he's a pretty special guy, for sure. So, kind of continuing on this conversation here, and I want to ask one more question on the clout. When you're on coverage, is there ever a moment where you're thinking to yourself, I should go for this sick shot because if it works, it's going to be awesome? Or do you, does any, none of that comes into your mind? You're just focused on your game? Or, or do you think about, you know, if I do this and I hit this, this is going to be pretty cool and a lot more people are going to see it? Yeah, I think that thought kind of creeps into your mind if you're playing bad and you're just like, well, screw it. I'm going to go for this crazy gap or I'm going to go for this, uh, I guess not. I didn't. I I wasn't thinking that when I threw my skip shot, but uh, yeah, it, it definitely is a thought that goes through your head. Like, oh, if I also on the on the other side, if you make a huge mistake, you also know that's on coverage as well. So, it definitely brings another element into your game plan. But ultimately, you're still sticking to your original strategy, or at least you should be. There's the players that um, do do crazy things because they want to stand out. But for me personally, I just kind of do what i'm supposed what i what i've always done the skip shot was a little crazy because i was lining up a my normal strategy like going straight at it i hadn't practiced that spot at all because who practices 70 feet from the pan on a 400 foot shot you don't do that unless you land there every single time which i didn't but the um it just didn't seem reasonable because the headwind was just blasting at me and i was just, i was kind of scared honestly so i was going with a safer play which would have been the skip shot and if Honestly, it was a decent shot even if it hadn't gotten the basket because it, it was already on the downward angle at when it connected with the with the chains, but the wind picked it up, stalled it, and just threw it into the basket. Um, kind of a one in a million opportunity right there or just a chance shot. It was a good shot, but my intention was definitely to get it close to the basket, not necessarily into the basket. But uh, the fact that it was on coverage after, like after I, I made it, like walking back to the next tee pad, I was just like, "Oh crap, that's that's gonna be on YouTube," <laughs> you know. So it's definitely a thought that goes through your head. But the more seasoned players, that they don't, they don't necessarily care about it that much. If anything, it makes them play better because they want to show the world what they can do. You know, talking a little bit about that, you know, being at home, it's very easy to be. You know, seeing a player that's not used to being on lead card or on Jomez or something like that going on there and then seeing them kind of just fall apart. Um, how real is that, you know, being going and making making the lead card or making coverage card um, 
and having those cameras on you, what does that feel like? And, you know, how it's, it's very easy from home to be like, oh, you know, why are they playing bad? Like, there's it's just another round. As fans, you know, but as a player, what does that feel like? And like, how real is it? You know, or like, can you remember the first time for you and like how it, how it felt? Yeah, it's uh, it's very real. It's very real because um, for the younger players or the players that are, that are still new to the tour on coverage for the first time, they know that everyone's going to see it. You know, and so the first mistake happens, and uh, they they kind of fall apart because it just snowballs and snowballs because the stress builds also being on the lead card without cameras is stressful enough like like we're talking about paul you know and ricky like playing with those guys um it's stressful you know because you don't want to look like an idiot in front of those guys so uh, uh there's a lot of elements that kind of compound as you get on that lead card and having jomez like three hundred fifty thousand subscribers um, and knowing that people are going to be in the comments being like, oh, why, hey, he missed a he missed a 20 footer, that that idiot, you know. <laughs> so um, for the more seasoned players, like personally for me, I love being on camera, even if I play bad, because I know people can see that I'm loving what I'm doing and people can see that I'm playing disc golf for a living. And uh, if anything, it's good for the brand, it's good for disc craft, just being on film. Um, but for the younger players, they're definitely more like, oh, my gosh, I got to do crazy things. And if I don't. If I make mistakes, it's going to be bad for me and everybody. But I think it's just an experience thing. The more you do it, the easier it gets. It's kind of like uh, if you go to like a McDonald's and you go in the back and start filming a cook, they might get nervous, you know, because they're like they might drop a burger or something like that. So it's kind of similar, but if you kept on doing it every day, it might be easier. So. I really like that analogy. That's a good way to end that conversation, Chandler. I love it. Let's jump into the hot take. What do you got for us today? Uh, my hot take was that uh, I really do believe this is true, and is that that's we're going to see a world champion in the next three years. Because what we were talking before in this episode um, about Cole Verdalen, um, one of my favorite players from Oregon. I love also from Oregon. We've got Gannon Burr, who almost just won uh, a Las Vegas Challenge and un uh, unfortunately uh, lost to Drew Gibson. Congratulations, Drew Gibson. Nothing against him. Fantastic player. But I think one of those guys, maybe not necessarily those three, maybe probably Gannon, honestly, because he's just getting better. Um, they're going to put together a really good run at a world championship and possibly win it. And this year, honestly, might be the year because we're playing in Kansas. So it's going to be windy. It's going to be actually pretty similar to Las Vegas conditions and Gannon obviously showed that he can, he can beat us, <laughs> beat all of us. So uh, I'll say it, I'll say it right here on this show. Gannon Burr is going to win 2020 worlds. If not, it's going to be me. We've talked about this on the show before about worlds and kind of what it means and, you know, winning worlds, you know, an argument I've had is, you know, what makes that tournament of worlds different from the weekend before and the weekend after it you know that gives it that notoriety you know as someone that's on tour is it that much tougher or do you think that world should be something that's more you know kind of at the end of the season it's more built up and it's more based off the season and points or something like that or do you think the way it is now is good for just anyone to have the opportunity to go and be you know world champion and win that tournament yeah, I like the I like where it is right now because we have uh, we have the Disco Pro Tour Championship, which kind of is what you're talking about, where it's like based off the points for the season and top 32 players. Um, but I think yeah, Worlds is a Worlds is a special tournament. The title of World Champion holds a lot of a lot of weight, um, and uh, you can see like after James Conrad had that finishing putt, you can just see the pressure that was lifted off his shoulder. You can just see the just like oh my gosh this is amazing. My life is going to be completely different after this. Um, such a cool moment. And uh, I think it's perfect where it is. I, I, I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't want it at the end of the season. Cause I know a lot of players are already like, I'm so done with all of this. So I think where it is in like somewhat kind of the middle of the middle of the year is, is a good time for it. Cause that's when a lot of players are playing at their peak and that's when we're going to see the best play. That boy Gannon is, ooh, man, he is tough. He, it, it, yeah, Kansas is going to be a super fun 
World Championship. I'm excited. Hopefully, Horatio, you and I will be able to slide on through and at least watch it. That would be pretty cool because it's only an hour, hour and a half away from us. So this is the time to go because it's going to be a long time before it comes back to DDO. But that was a good hot take. I like it. I also will just add in my two cents. I think Kyle Klein, I know he hasn't started yeah. off the best. Yeah. But I still am going with my prediction that I think he'll finish inside the top five at the end of the year. And I think he definitely will have a shot at the world championship. So I, I, I'm i going to throw Kyle out there. But yeah, I, I love that. I really like that. But let's get into the ace round ratio. Why don't you explain that for the newer viewers and get us going with the first question? Yeah, I'm excited about this. You know, I, I love Discraft. You know, I have no reason to, you know put a certain, you know, company in my bag or specifically, but, you know, I just, I like, I love disc you know, the consistency, the, the swirls, they make really pretty discs. So, you know, I, I was excited for this episode. I'm excited for this question. You know, you're taking a player to get their first set of discs. What one putter, mid and fairway or driver would you recommend them by? Well, the first putter I ever had was the Magnet. I wouldn't recommend that one. It's a bit, little bit, it feels a little weird in the hand, but the most popular putter that I'd go with is the Challenger. Um, just base plastic, Prote plastic. It feels good. It flies good. It's a good starter plastic. Uh, for the mid, you've got to go with the best mid range ever created. The Buzz, get that ESP plastic, nice and grippy plastic, nice and straight. It'll teach you how to disc fly is better than any other disc you can throw. Um, and for the driver... I got to go with the Chandler Fry Tour Series Discraft ESP Swirly Surge. This thing is fantastic. It's a, It can fit in anyone's bag. Um, it's got some good torque resistance. You can put some turn on it. It's good for forehands, good for backhands. If you want to throw a tomahawk with it, go ahead. It might not work out too well, but um, it also has my name on it, so it's going to fly well. <laughs> What uh, what what kind of like stability is it? Where can people pick it up? And and I do have to ask: Was the surge not in production, and then you brought it back into production, or was it just not very popular before you put your name on it? Yeah, it's been out of production for quite a few years. There's been some limit limited runs. I know Ledgestone um just did a run of Big Z surges in their latest wave, um, but it was completely out of production. It's not in their normal production schedule, so I have brought it back, and it is better than. Um, it's a 11 speed. It's 11 five neg one three, so it's kind of similar. And it's like in the same realm as the ring, kind of right up there. I like to think of it as somewhat of a faster vulture. So I think a lot of people are missing that um, gap in their bag, that 11 speed. Uh, if they, yeah, and it's a 1.7, I believe, stability rating. So it has some good stability. Um, it's just a good flyer. And if you watch the latest episode of our latest round or last round, geez of the open at Belton where I play in the chase card on gatekeeper media. You can see me throwing it everywhere and see how a pro pro throws it. Nice. Awesome. Well, Hey, let's get to the second question here. Yeah. What is the favorite course you have played in one course that you have yet to play that you want to cross off the bucket list? Uh, my favorite course has got to be Milo MacGyver. It's the first course I ever played and it's the site of Beaver Safe thing. Like I said, my favorite tournament of the year, every year I played it like 11 or 12 times. Um, so yeah, Milo MacGyver in Estacada, Oregon, I believe it's actually called Riverbend Disc Golf Course, but the locals just call it Milo. Uh, it's beautiful. It's got a good combination of wooded um, and open open holes. And just everything you can ask for if you want a good Pacific Northwest Disc Golf Course. A course that I'd love to play that I haven't yet, I haven't been to Europe yet, so I'd love to play Narva. Um, that course, I've watched European Open footage hundreds of times so um if i can go out there and play there before i, I heard it was possibly closing I'm, i don't think it is anymore but there's always that lingering uh chance that it might be going away so i want to get there before it closes okay sweet yeah that one looks like a beautiful course you know hopefully i'm excited to see some of that coverage this year if you know some of those tournaments out there just in europe yeah. in general all right next question we got for you here is you know, one tip you would give to yourself when you started taking, you know, disc golf seriously? Uh, learn a forehand. Um, I When I first started, I was just backhand, 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 and I didn't really even give any credence to, like, the importance of the sidearm. So I think if I was to go back in time and find my 13-year-old self, I'd say – Get that forehand going because you're going to need it a lot with your if you choose to be a touring professional. 
Um, I, I have a decent one now. I've worked on it quite a bit in the last couple of years. Um, Nate Sexton, who I've stayed with uh, multiple times in the off season, has helped me out quite a bit just uh, talking to him about it and playing a lot of practice rounds with him and just watching him because he is one of the sidearm goats. And then uh, also watching Big Germ. That guy has the best finesse I've ever seen. So, um, But if I was to go back in time, yeah, you got to have all the tools in your bag if you want to be successful. And sidearm is a big uh, is a power tool. So, Yeah, just real quick uh, for that one. You know, I feel like before back in the day, you know, I've heard and seen a lot of stuff. People didn't, you know, put a lot of importance into, into sidearm. Um, you know, I've seen more players recently – and even Eagle McMahon throwing with a left or throwing with their other arm. Do you think mm-hmm. that throwing with your other arm for our time now is that new version of sidearm? You know, do you think in mm-hmm. like 10 years, players will be like, I wish I had practiced with my other arm and was at least decent in it? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's possible. I think it's easier just to throw a forehand, but yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of players on tour like, one one player comes to mind who Nathan Queen. I know I know he's a lefty, but he's backhand. He only throws forehands if he absolutely has to. Even James Conrad. Now that I'm thinking about it, but uh, if you want to be successful, it's easy, it's just easier to have a forehand, but you can still be just out it. You just have to work a little harder. Cool, makes sense. Fourth question yeah. we got for you: What is your favorite memory playing disc golf? Um, probably so. Uh, back in 2018, I believe I went to Alaska. And I competed in the King of the Hill tournament against Brian Schwaberger, who, like, in the last four years before that tournament, had just swept the floor with me. It's on a it's on a mountain course, and he was just throwing thumbers everywhere, and I was just I don't know what I was doing. Um, but in 2018, I went up there and I took down the uh, King of the Hill A tier. That was my first A tier over Schweber, Schweberger, um, Schusterich, and Austin Hannum. It was a fantastic experience, and I was there with my aunt and uncle who used to live there, and just being able to experience my first big win with them was awesome. And then the previous, uh, the next week, I actually did the Alaska State Disc Golf Championships at um, a course called Moose Pretzel in Homer, Alaska, which is one of my favorite courses, and uh, I ended up winning that one too. So I, I won what I called the Alaska Sweep. I'm not sure anyone else has done that yet. <laughs> that was uh, that's probably one of my favorite uh, disc golf moments just because alaska is one of my favorite places to go and the disc golf up there not a lot of people have experienced it but it's it's amazing yeah you know that's one cool thing about disc golf it takes you some it takes some really cool places you know you don't you don't even have to travel like somewhere crazy like alaska but just you know courses because they're built in places where there's trees and other stuff you know it takes you to cool places all right last question we got for you here is what is the biggest mistake you see new players make um, I mean, I could go back to just saying not learning, like trying to specialize in one or the other um, throw. So either backhand or forehand, learn everything. Um, what, the kind of the cliche thing that a lot of pros say is don't throw fast discs too fast. Like don't, 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 don't just throw a destroyer or like a force or a nuke into your bag your first couple of rounds. Hold off on those. Get some mid ranges. Get some putters. Start throwing those because those make you learn how discs fly. Like as far as grip, as far as speed, they'll they'll teach you finesse. Um, they'll get you going a lot better. Because if you go out there with a nuke, you're just gonna hook it. It's gonna go straight left. You're not gonna learn anything. You're gonna get frustrated and uh, just have a bad time. So go out there, get a buzz, get a challenger, get a Luna, and uh, throw it around. And then after you feel comfortable with those discs, move up to like the speed seven, speed eights. Get get some vultures, get some surges. Um, you know, I know it's 11, it's a bit fast, but you, it, you, you, can, you can throw it if you want to, if you're beginning. Um, and then move on to those nukes and those uh, Zeus's because it'll just make the, your journey a lot easier. Awesome, Chandler. This has been so much fun. Thank you for your time tonight. Thanks for coming on. Best of luck to you for, you know, Texas States and the rest of the season coming up. Where can the people connect with you and continue to follow your journey? Yeah, check out my Instagram on it's channel underscore fry. Um, it's just documenting my disc golf journey, uh, and also my I, I put a lot of stories out there. My other, um, so check that out. Check out my Facebook fry. I believe that's what it is. Um, and also go give my sponsors a follow. Go check out Discraft Disc Golf. They're putting out some amazing content. The Ledgestone Open, Whale Sacks, Pack X Disc Golf. 
Upper Park Disc Golf. They're all doing fantastic things. Check them out. Give them a follow. Show them sh some love. They, they produce some great products, and they help support me on tour. So uh, check them out, and uh, I, I appreciate you, Chain Clinkers. It was fun. All right, man. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for taking the time you know, to sit with us. And you know, whenever you get burned out or you're having a bad round, just remember that you're living most of our, you know, our dreams of our, you know, just average folk. We're sitting at a desk, you know, crunching numbers or doing whatever we're doing. You know, we just can't wait to get off the clock and go play. You're living the dream, you know, enjoy it while you can. And, you know, best of luck to you and, you know, wishing them about the best this season. I appreciate that. It's easy to forget that, but I appreciate that. Awesome. That's awesome.